If you have your Bibles tonight, turn to the book of Revelation chapter 1, the book of Revelation chapter 1, and tonight we are still in our series, Which, which Path Should I Take, and tonight is the path of persecution. How many of you know that you live this Christian life, you're going to be persecuted for it? The Bible teaches that Jesus was persecuted, and we're going to be persecuted. But that doesn't mean he doesn't love us, because he does love us. It's just part of this Christian life. And so we're going to talk about that, and we're going to talk about who's in control of all our lives and who's with us all the time, how he takes care of us, and how he's in the midst of us all the time. Well, we serve an amazing God. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand tonight in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, and we're going to read there verses 9 through 16. And then we'll get into the message in just a moment. The Bible says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and also unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as the flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and if they, as if they burn in the furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you. We thank you for these verses that we've read out of the book of Revelation tonight, and we ask that you add your spirit unto them. And Father, as we preach, speak to our heart tonight. Help us to never be the same because we've heard your word. As we leave here tonight, help us to be different. Help us to uh, spread your word to those that are lost. And Father, we'll praise you forevermore for what you do for us here tonight. In your precious name we pray these things. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Shake somebody's hand tell them you love them tonight. Amen. Well, this morning we talked about a few things of this story here, this in the book of Revelation. We talked about the setting of this vision. We talked about where John was. He was on the Isle of Patmos, and the Bible says that he was there because he was exiled there. That means he was in captivity there. Uh, They put him there as a prison. On that island, of course, there was awful conditions. We know that uh, from uh, writings that there was exhausting labor on this island and that there was insufficient food and there was uh, sleeping on the bare ground and there was rats and all that that implies and there was all kinds of things on this island. Matter of fact, if we were just looking at the circumstances of, the, the, of what he was going through, we would say to ourselves that, you know, he, he was in a horrible way. But then we find out that he had a conversation with the Lord himself. The Bible says as he was there on the Lord's day that the Lord came to him. And in verse 10 and 11 it says, And I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, What thou seest write in the book and send it to the seven churches. So, we said this morning, you know, the phrase, the Lord's Day, we, we like to preach that it was on a Sunday, that it was that day that the Lord came to him. 
Uh, the problem is, you know, we can look at it that way because of, of referring to Sunday because of Christ's resurrection. But uh, the reference to this here is to say that he was in prayer. He, he was in supplication with the Lord. It was uh, the Lord's day in his heart and all these things. So whether it was on Sunday or not, it really doesn't matter. But we'll think it was on Sunday. Amen. We'll act like it was on Sunday. And the Bible says that the Lord came to him. And the thing that is so precious about this is not only did the Lord come to him, but he opened up things for him. In his persecution, in the most depressing, persecuting time of his life, the Lord came down to be with John, and not only that, not only to be with him, but to open up the heavens so that he could see in the heavens. That he could see things that only he saw, nobody else has saw, and, and he had seen these things for what they were. The Bible says not only do we look at this and we see, you know, the setting of the vision, but we see the unfolding of the vision. The Bible says there in Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 through 16, And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to foot and girt about with the paps of a golden girdle, his head and his hairs were white like wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice the sound of many waters. It's just giving us a description and unfolding of who John is seeing. Now, a lot of times we look at this and we say, now, preacher, you know, in a lot of churches and a lot of denominations say, well, the book of Revelation, preacher, cannot be, you know, un you, can't, uh, you can't preach the book of Revelation because we really don't know what it means. But the word revelation means unveiling. So what Jesus is saying to us is, I'm going to show you things of the future. I'm going to show you, I'm going to unveil these things in the book of Revelation so that you know what's going to happen in the future. And so as John is here and he's looking into the future things, the Lord is revealing a, a look at his present work to John, and he's showing him the glorified Son of God. Now think about that. He's looking at the glorified Son of God. So what is the aspects of the Lord's ministry right now? Well, first of all, you have to understand that as we look at this and as the voice spoke to John, he, he saw these seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven, seven candlesticks, he saw one likened to the Son of Man. In other words, he saw uh, these, uh, these candlesticks represent, and we're going to tell you that in just a minute and show you that, the churches and the church ages, but not only that, it shows God walking in the midst of the church. And how many of you know tonight that's true? Because you can be here in this church, and I'm not just talking about the church building, I'm talking about the body of Christ, and you can feel the Holy Spirit moving among us. I mean, that's an amazing thing to me, to feel the Holy Spirit and know that He's alive in my life. And know that He's here tonight and that He loves me. And, and you know what, folks? I don't know what I would do without the Holy Spirit living inside of me. My life would just be a mess without the Holy Spirit. How about you tonight? I mean, can you say that? Your life would just be a mess without... And you know where you were when you were lost without Jesus? Without Him living inside of you? You know that was a mess? And I'm so glad tonight that he lives inside of me. So that's one thing we can praise the Lord for tonight. Amen? If we're saved. If you're not saved, I hope before tonight you'll be saved before tonight's over. So what was the aspects of the Lord's ministry? Well, the first thing we talked about was that Christ empowers his church. That's his people. The church. The bride of Christ. The Bible says in verses 12 and 13, Turn to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man. Now verse 20 says this, The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So there's the churches. Not just seven churches, even though they were seven churches in, in, in sequence there that these letters were delivered to. 
uh, not only that, but they talk about the seven church ages, the, 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 the churches over the ages of time. And he says, over all these church ages, I'll be right in the midst of them. I, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to be right there with you. And we know from studying the churches that some of them churches, and even our church age that we live in tonight, rebelled against God, but God still is in the midst of them. And he's still the light of them. And he still loves them. So we saw that Christ empowers the church. The second thing that we saw this morning is Christ intercedes for his church. Not only is he walking in the mist, not only is he here with us tonight, not only do we feel his Holy Spirit, but the Bible says that Christ intercedes for his people, for his church. In verse 13, it says, Clothe with a garment down to foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. Now, we know that, that the kings wore such robes, and it was really a robe of royalty. But here, in the book of Revelation, this robe is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to describe a, a robe worn by the high priest. Now, if you study the robe of the high priest in the Old Testament, you will understand that everything that's on there represents something. It's a beautiful robe. It, it was made, made with the best stuff, uh, the, 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 the best things of that time, silver and gold. It was, it was made with all kinds of jewels and different things. It, it was a very expensive robe. But here, when we see this robe here in the book of Revelation... It pictures Christ not only as, as being prophet and, king, or prophet and king, but it also pictures him now in the book of Revelation as being our high priest. And how many of you know tonight he is our high priest? He is. Thank the Lord for that. Listen, I, I don't have to go down to the church and talk to a priest anymore. I've got a high priest. And I can get on my knees and talk to him anytime I want to. I, matter of fact, I can be driving in the car. Now, I don't shut my eyes, but I can drive in the car and talk to him. Amen? You may not want to get beside of me while I'm in the car. But we can talk to him anywhere we're at. Because he's our high priest. Some of the verses I gave you this morning was Hebrews 4.14 and Hebrews 9.11-15, if you want to read that again. But tonight... And you say amen right there. Tonight, I want to talk about how Christ purifies his church. If he's walking in the midst and he's our high priest, how many of you know he purifies his church, his people? Where do we get our purity from? We don't get it from ourselves. We don't get it because we're in some kind of, uh, you know, we sing in the choir or we, we teach a Sunday school class or even me preaching. We don't get it from that. We get it from God. And if we don't get our purity from God, then we don't have any purity. Amen? We don't have any. So we get our purity from God. Christ purifies His church. Listen to what verses 14 and 15 of Revelation 1 says. His head and His hairs were... A white like wool as white as snow and his eyes were as the flame of fire and his feet like unto fine brass and as if they were they burned in a furnace you see he's described his clothing in verse 13 he's described his person in verses 14 and 15 and, and the new testament sets forth the holy standard christ has established for his people for his church for his bride do you know tonight there's a holy standard that God wants you to live by? I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes people have forgotten that there's a holiness that we're to walk after. Be ye holy as I am holy. I think in this old world we live in tonight, we think everything goes. And I'm here to tell you, not everything goes when it comes to Christ and the life we're living for Him. And you know what, folks? I'm glad that I can study the Bible, and I know you are. I'm glad I have a Bible, aren't you? I'm glad you have a Bible that we can study and know what God expects out of us. You see, God doesn't just save us and leave us in the dark. He saves us and He teaches us. He teaches us because He walks among us. He lives among us. He's our high priest. But He teaches us because He wants us to live a holy life. He wants us to be more like Him. Now, are we ever going to get there? No, not until we get to heaven, but we ought to try every day. 
We ought to run that race every day that Paul spoke of. So in knowing this, I want to read some verses to you. Here's what he says about holiness. In Matthew 5, 48, about his church, about his people, he says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. He said, Oh, oh, preacher, I can't live that way. I'm not perfect. No, you're not. And I'm not perfect. But I serve one that is. Amen. Amen. He's perfect. And I want to live my life as close to him every day that I can possibly live. Aren't you glad he's a forgiving God? I mean, let's think about this just for a moment before we go any farther. Aren't you glad he's a forgiving God tonight? That he forgives us of our sins. <laughs> he washes our sins with his precious blood. And forgiveness comes because of his blood. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, For I have espoused you to, be, to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That's what he says about you. And then he says in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, talking about living this life. Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church, the body, and gave himself for it, that he might what sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. God's got high expectations for you, doesn't he? And for me. But the problem is we don't have high expectations. Amen? We don't. He does, but we don't. Listen to the Bible, what it says in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. I want to show you some things about Christ tonight in this scripture. And we're talking just like, you know, with John, the persecution that's going to come. And how many of you know persecution is coming to us? And the longer we live in this world, it's going to get worse. How many of you can honestly raise your hand tonight and say, well, in the last five years, it's got better? There's none of us can say that. Because it's got worse. And you think the next five years is not going to be worse? I mean, think, what's, uh, think just what happened in the last five years. Gay marriage. Abortion is up on the uprise again. If you think about this wickedness, we can lie. People lie and have no consequences about it. I mean, it, it's just been horrible. Murders in Chicago alone. Just look it up. I think it's up to, what, 900 now or somewhere in there? Just in one city. People killing one another. God said in the end times that all these things would be an uprise in them. That they wouldn't believe the truth. Amen? That's what he said. He said they'd make right wrong and wrong right. And how many would say tonight, amen to that? It's happening. Persecution is coming, and it's getting worse every day. So God is saying to us, what happens to us during this persecution time? He's telling us who we should be and how we can be that. The first thing I want to talk about in this description of Christ, it says in verse 14, His head and His hair as white as a wool like snow. What is this the description of about our Savior? It's a description of his deity. It's a description of our Savior's deity. He possesses the same attribute uh, of, our, of holy knowledge and wisdom as the Father. How many believe that? When you've seen him, you've seen the Father. That's what he said. There's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost lives in us. So he said, when you see him, you see the Father. He has all knowledge. You see, this word uh, here, uh, this word uh, translate leukos, which means that he is bright, that he is blazing, that he is brilliant. That's what it means about him. 
That's who we're serving tonight. It, it symbolizes here when it says his head and hair as white as wool like snow. It symbolizes here about the characteristics of Christ that he is holy, but he's also truthful. You want to know about yourself? Ask him. The problem is we really don't want to know about ourselves because we know if we ask him, he'll tell us. And he'll show us who we really are. But folks, you know what? We need to ask him and let him show us. Because if there's something not right, we need to get it right. It symbolizes here, his head, his hair, and as white as wool, like snow. It symbolizes Christ in his holy truthfulness. The second thing in verse 14 says about him being our God. It says his eyes were like a flame of fire. That's John looking. John seeing him. He said his eyes were like a flame of fire. In other words, what this this is talking about as he's walking in the midst of his church and his people and and he's our high priest, he's saying his searching penetrates the, the very depths of everything about us in his church. He knows everything about his people. There's nothing that surprises God about you or about me. How many understand that? He knows us. He searches us. He, his penetrating eyes are looking at us. And, and, and in reality, everything is there for him to know. There's nothing that shocks him about us. He knows it. Matthew 10, 26 talks about this. And it says about the precious Lord that we serve, there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. That's what God says about us. That he knows everything about us. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 13. It says there, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. The Bible says his eyes were like flames of fire. In other words, he's omniscient and he's walking in the midst of his church. He never fails to recognize sin in his church. The third thing about God, verse 15, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in the furnace. Of course, this is a clear reference to judgment. How many of you know that God will one day judge? But right now, in the midst of his church, he is judging sin in the church. He doesn't let sin get by. Just like with Sodom and Gomorrah, just like with all the sins that David committed in the Bible and all were open to God, I'm here to tell you, in the church, the bride of Christ, the church, us that are saved, He knows our sin. And He judges our sin. He's a righteous God. You know, the picture here is as in the old days, in Bible days, kings would sit on elevated thrones. And as they sat on those thrones, the only thing that could be seen from the people that were judged below them was the king's feet. In other words, when he judged, uh, the, the subjects were under his feet. And it's the same thing with the Lord Jesus one of these days. But right now, He is judging the church. He is judging inside the church of our sins. When you see this, you see the red, hot, glowing feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's pictured as He is moving through the church. He's not standing still. He knows our lives. He knows who we are. You can't fool Him. You can dress up. Look your best, and you can fool everybody on this earth, but you cannot fool God. And John's seen that. God is in His church exercising His chastening authority. By the way, if He loves you, He's going to chasten you. He's going to whip you. Been whipped lately. My daddy used to say, you ain't been whipped lately, have you? (laughs) And by the way, he has no problem dealing out punishment if need be. 
Amen? <laughs> because there's one thing about it. You can't talk him out of it. Because he knows it. You know, I used to think when I was a little kid, you know, when daddy come home, mom would say, now your daddy's going to get you when he comes home. And I used to think of every excuse I could use, you know, and I, I was going to talk daddy out of it, you know. I, I can talk him out of this whipping. I know I can, you know. I'd get my story together. You know, I'd have it down packed, and he'd get home. He'd say, your mother said. And I'm going to believe your mother instead of you. It didn't work. I planned all that out, and it never worked. Same thing sometimes with us and God. But you can't talk yourself out of God's chastening. And he's ready to do it right now, if need be. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 20, now listen, 5 through 10, he says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you, that's that's kind of like when your daddy used to say, Now I wouldn't whip you if I didn't love you. Right? I wouldn't whip you if I, you know, I never believed that, but I believe God. I'm just kidding. I believe God because he wouldn't whip us if he didn't love us and know where we were going. He has to straighten us up, folks. He knows what's around the curve before we get there. And sometimes he has to whip us before we get to the curve. Amen? Listen to the rest of this, uh, verse 8. But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are ye partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily, for the, for they verily, for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he, for our, read that with me. That we might be partakers of? He said, I'm here. I'm walking amongst the church, amongst the bride of Christ. I'm your high priest. And I'll whip you when you need it. That's what he said. There's a fourth thing. We're talking about who Christ is. Where is what's he doing right now? Christ speaks in authority to his church. Revelation 1.15 says this, And his voice as the sound of many waters. Now we can't handle that right now. But one of these days when we get to heaven, we'll have perfect hearing, won't we? Perfect eyes and all this. But John, when he heard him, he said it sounds like a voice of many waters. A mighty roar is what he's talking about. It's like a surf crashing down on the rocks. That's the loudness of his voice. In Ezekiel chapter 43 verse 2 it says, And behold the glory of God of Israel came from the way of the east, and his voice was like a noise of many waters, and the earth... Uh, shined with his glory. His voice. When it talks about it here, it's talking about his sovereign power. How many of you know tonight he's sovereign? And through his power tonight, listen to me, it's his sovereign power. It's the voice of a supreme authority. John 5, 28 and 29 says this, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear His voice. And He goes on to say, And shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. He said there's coming a day that the bodies will raise out of the grave when He calls them. That's who God is. 
John said, here's what he looks like. Here's what he is like. When Christ speaks, we must listen. When the Holy Spirit speaks, we must listen. Especially the children of God. We must listen. Why? Because we've heard His voice before. I remember when I was lost without Jesus. And I would go to church on Sundays and they would preach the gospel message like I'm preaching tonight. And I would sit there and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit was all over me to get saved. And I could hear His voice. And it wasn't just a still, small voice. It was a loud voice telling me to get right with Him. To quit living the way that I was living. You remember that, don't you? When you were lost. The voice of God. We must listen. Matthew 17, 5 says, While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says, God who at some, sundry times and divers man, manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days, listen to me, spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Fifth, Christ controls his church. He's not going to let his church get away from him. He controls us. He is in charge. He's in charge. And I'm going to show you how. The Bible says in verse 16, it says, And he hath in his right hand seven stars. In verse 20, he says, The seven stars are the what? How many of you know tonight that Jesus is the head of the church? He's over it. That's the reason a lot of times, you know, I get down and out sometimes, you know. But I start thinking, well, who's in charge of this thing, me or you? And he's in charge. And I quit worrying. Because I think back at all the times he's brought me through things and brought us through things. And, 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 you know, once you go through things, you just have to say, well, he's in charge. I'm not in charge. I'm just a servant. But the Bible speaks of the preachers here. We know that Jesus is the head of the church and the ruler of his kingdom, but he exercised authority in his church. Listen to what John says. He says, in his right hand there are seven stars, and these are identified as angels of the seven churches. And what that means is he's talking about authority. How God puts in place authority in his body. And by the way, folks... There is authority in the body. He's the head. He's over it. But those in authority as he puts under him are, are not angels from heaven, but they are leadership in the church. I remember when God was calling me to preach, and I thought to myself, I saw all these preachers over the years, you know, and, and I used to think as a little boy, you know, as a little boy, I used to think, you know, they were the closest thing to God that I had ever seen, you know, on this earth. I mean, I really did as a little boy. Did you not feel that way as a little girl and a little boy? I mean, this is the one God's put in the church. And you want to shake the preacher's hand. Now they want to run from the preacher. So what God is saying here is that this wonderful passage is for pastors. He's telling that Jesus holds us in his right hand and he leads us and he guides us and we lead the church. That's what he's saying. Pastors are to be instruments. That's all. Instruments which Christ can use. He is the head of the church and he mediates what he wants through his pastors, through the word of God. And pastors that won't study and won't get with God and won't pray are not worth their salt. But if they do, God is leading them and guiding them, then we, as the body of Christ, are led by Him and the under-shepherd is the pastor. 
The Bible says that's the way the standards for leadership is set up. Set up in the New Testament church. For Christ has assigned leadership to his pastors. It means that he controls the church. He controls his pastors. By the way, folks, you don't have to worry about God taking care of pastors if they're not doing the right thing. You say, oh, preacher, I've known pastors that got away with it. They, they haven't got away with anything. Amen? They've not got away with anything. One of these days, God will reckon with those pastors if they don't get it right under the blood of Christ. He'll reckon with them. He don't need you to do it. He don't need me to do it. He knows how to do it. What a responsibility, oh, you think about that. One day every pastor will give an account on how they obeyed Jesus in leading under him. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see many people stepping up to do that. I will be judged by God one day, not only for a pastor in this church, for all the churches I've pastored. He doesn't forget anything and how I led people. And I don't know about you, but if you think about that, if you thought about it too long, without His wonderful forgiveness and His grace and mercy, that'd scare you to death. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7 through seven says it like this. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. I've got to hurry. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetousness, or covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall and the snare of the devil and one day God will have every pastor in front of him and they will be judged on these verses one day I'll have to stand before God for all of this have I failed in my life? sure I have have I asked God for forgiveness? sure I have but it doesn't change the fact that I'll answer to God for the way I pastor churches. But on the other hand, as God walks through the church, you will answer to God for the way that you live in the bride of Christ. Can I give you one last thing? I'll be quick. You've heard that before, haven't you? Christ protects his church. Revelation 1.16 says, And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. The Lord Jesus Christ's presence also provides protection for his church. Listen, folks, you, you, you are not the protector. He's the protector. And he's good at it. He knows how to protect his church. He's speaking here again on his judgment against the enemies from within and without the church. You know, those who attack Christ's church, the body, those who sow lies and create discord and harm his people, these folks one-on-one will be personally dealt with by God himself as he walks in the midst of the church. Nobody gets away with it, including the pastor, but also the people. But he does it as a father. Not at one that hates you. He loves you. He whips us as a father. He tries to show us the error of our ways, doesn't he? How does he do that, preacher? He does it through preaching. 
He does it through teaching. He does it through Bible study. He does it through even sometimes the, just the Holy Spirit and the music as it's moving. He'll, he'll do it through different things just to show us where we stand with Him and the best thing to do. The best, the best thing is to know that when He does that, He loves you. He loves you. So how many of you know if we sow discord and do these things, we need to be whipped? You're not going to agree with me on that? We need to be whipped. Because sometimes men and women can't work these things out on their own. And sometimes God just has to step in and work them out. But when he does it, how many of you know tonight, it's always right. And he does it with love and care. That's who Christ is in his church. And I said all that and preached all this today to let us know that during times of persecution, we have a friend. We have somebody that's going to be right there with us. He's never going to leave us, never going to forsake us. He's going to take our hand and walk us through these next few years that we have upon this earth. And he's saying to us tonight, don't you worry. I've got it all taken care of. Praise his holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for tonight. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for the message tonight. Thank you for being with us here tonight. And Father, we just ask that you will bless us with the preaching of your word as we go home. Help us to not forget what you've taught us today. And Father, help us to always be mindful that you're in the midst of your church. That you are our high priest that we can go to you and anytime we want to. That, Lord, as you're here, as you're in the midst of the church, that there's times that judgment will fall. Help us to never forget that when you do judge us, it's a loving judge that does that. It's a God that loves us, his children. But, Father, there may be someone here tonight that do, they do not know you in the free pardon of sin. They have never been saved. And I pray right now, Lord, that you will touch them. And help them know right now that you love them, that you want to save them. You want them to go to heaven. You want them to be part of the body of Christ. But Lord, they have to make that decision. You may be here tonight and God is speaking to you. God has spoke to you during this message of how wonderful and how great how majestic he really is. And tonight, you may need to come to this altar. This altar is open just for you. God loves you. So if you need to come tonight, I'm going to ask you to step out from where you are right now and come. Just step out and come tonight. Is there anybody? This preacher of the Lord has spoke to me tonight, and I'm thankful. He spoke to me of how wonderful he is. How powerful he is. Let's all stand tonight. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord today.